Good evening. My name is Jake Morrill, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the February lecture in the professional lecture series hosted by the Bowen Center. This evening's lecture is on the relationship between writing and Bowen theory. Before introducing the evening's presenter, a few housekeeping tips. First, please keep your audio muted throughout. Also, if you have questions uh, or tech troubles, um, please communicate with conference coordinator Emma Voorhees uh, through the Zoom chat. After the presentation, there will be time for discussion. Uh, there won't be a break midway through, so take whatever notes uh, you think might help uh, um, retain uh, uh, what you're wanting to talk about uh, at the end. Now, I'm glad to introduce uh, this evening's speaker, Dr. Barbara Lehman. Dr. Lehman is a writer, grandmother, researcher, licensed professional counselor, and faculty member at the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family. With a PhD from the Pastoral Counseling Department of Loyola University, Maryland, she aims to be a thoughtful presence, offering new perspectives with a wry sense of humor. Her most recent book, All the Families of the Earth, is a biblical fiction published in October 2023. She and her husband live in Washington, D.C., where they are avid national baseball fans, hoping for a miracle. Dr. Lehman. Thank you, Jake, and thank you, everyone, uh, for your presence here tonight. Um, let me go ahead and get my slides going here. So, um, writing and defining a self is my topic tonight, and I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to Dorothy Sayers, who wrote a lot of mysteries and some important nonfiction too. Um, but she she wrote a little story called the the vindictive story of the footsteps that ran. And so this is a um, spoiler alert. It was published in the 1920s. And if you haven't read it yet, I can't be responsible for that. So here we go. Um, tonight, um, I'll be um, referencing several books and I'll, I'll show those on the next slide. I'll give some thoughts on the writing process. I'll take a close look at this vindictive story of the footsteps that ran, and also uh, talk about Sayers' nonfiction, a little bit about my experience as a writer, and then I'm going to close with Dorothy Sayers and her family's life story. Now here's the main books I'm gonna be looking at. Um, say, Dorothy Sayers wrote The Mind of the Maker, um, she wrote lots of mysteries, which are, is in that book on the right. Those are all her short stories. And then there's a book about her and her correspondence, mainly with C.S. Lewis, um, called Dorothy and Jack, that I'll be referencing tonight. I'm also going to be mentioning God After Einstein, what's really going on in the universe. <clears throat> and this is a, a reminder that the Bowen Center is doing a conference in April um, called Faith, Functioning, and Bowen Theory, and John Pott is our keynote speaker at that event, um, and you all are, are welcome to attend. Um, I'll also be talking about my most recent book, All the Families of the Earth, Therapists in Bible Times. So, um, writing. Um, what does it bring to the writer herself? That's my question right now, <clears throat> and I'm going to ask you all if you would like to, to put in just a couple of words into the chat or maybe a sentence um, about, about what you find important about writing. How is it useful to you? And if you would like to put that in the chat, um, I'm going to be looking at those later, not tonight, because um, um, I think it would probably take the whole hour and a half to do that. Um, but I will be looking at it later to see what everybody's ideas are about this about writing itself. Okay. 
Um, once that is in the chat, I'm going to ask that um, the chat um, be used from here on out tonight for any technical problems you're having, you can you can um, you know chat with the conference coordinator about that. Um, but um, please hold your questions until the end, and we have a time to discuss them. Okay, now I've done a little bit of a deep dive on this question, um, and this these are the things I came up with. Um, a bunch of things. How I see it. Um, in the first place, writing gives me clarity that I might not have had before I sat down to write something. I notice that a lot in emails. <clears throat> I'm finding that it takes me a lot of time to write an email. Well, an email is not just an email. It's a way of defining yourself. So that's what takes the time. Now, those of us who get too busy editing our emails, maybe you're going too far with it. But I think it does bring clarity to write your thoughts that are going out to someone else um, that, that you wouldn't have had as long as you were just mulling them over in your mind. Um, for me, writing brings insight and perspective. Um, you know, I can, I can be writing a, a grocery list and all of a sudden, oh yeah, you know, something I hadn't thought of. I start to connect the dots. Um, the third thing about writing is the energy which comes from defining myself. And I don't think we can underestimate that. Any time one differentiates a self from others, it brings energy to oneself. And I, I think it's very important. It is for me. Um, and it and it brings it makes me write more because I get energy from writing. Um, the, um, the approach and tone is something that I look at a lot in my own writing. If I find myself um, with a tone that I think is uh, negative, off-putting, whatever, um, I have a chance, you know, if it's in writing to stop and say, well, what's that about? I have a chance to think about it. Um, the next thing is that it gives me a chance for a conversation within myself. And this is that top down, bottom up functioning between our intellectual system and our emotional system that I think is actually happening through the writing process. One can look at an emotion and, you know, with, um, with one's, um, hopefully thoughtful perspective on it, see what's in there that matters and what is in there that would lead one astray. Now, um, I, I put in another bullet point here because the opposite does sometimes happen. You know, a, a person can spend a lot of time writing and then notice that, oh, what I've been doing is letting my intellectual system serve my emotional system. So I can be riding along, you know, and and find that no, that's not that's not reasonable. Um, so it helps me to get neutral. Um, the next thing is the word purpose, and it happens at a couple of levels. One is that you know, I think it's important to to um, keep our purposes written down. In other words, to know you know. What is my purpose here tonight? What is my purpose with this year? What am I trying to do with it? Um, but within that, when, when one starts to write, the purpose sometimes emerges from the writing. Um, so the last thing is that I think writing is fun. Um, you know, it's creative um, and and um, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, sometimes I just, at the end, I just say to myself, I, I didn't know I thought. So the vindictive story of the footsteps that ran. Um, so 
Some people think this was Dorothy Sayers' very first story. It's for sure that it was written in the 1920s. Um, but um, it's it was early. And I think she must have had a lot of fun writing it. I mean, how did she come up with that idea of hiding the murder weapon in that all too obvious and yet hidden spot? And the choice of writing mysteries, I think, is a way that she defined herself. Because, you see, she was not going to be bored in the writing. You know, neither was she going to bore her readers. Her purpose seems to be something around seeing the truth of a thing. And I mean her purpose in the short story, which I, I think is about 16, 17 pages. Um, so, you know, I don't know whether she had the idea for the story and the whole thing came to her in a moment or whether she developed it over time. I, I don't know that. But, but as I read what she wrote, somewhere in there was um, an underlying interest in finding out what really happened, what was the truth. It begins with Lord Peter and his faithful bunter at the home of a young doctor who was doing research on rats. And Lord Peter's noticing that one of the cages needed to be fixed. When the doctor comments, and by the way, almost the whole story is done with dialogue, not description. Um, anyhow, when the doctor wonders how Peter would have noticed that detail, um, given that he didn't seem to be paying any attention at all, Peter describes how his brain works. That it seems to notice things before he becomes aware of them. Well, a hundred years later, Neuroscience research is backing up this idea. Um, the idea comes up again when Peter is trying to solve the case. He says there's something he's not able to sort out, but it's there, latent, he says. <clears throat> Reminded of the word by Bunter, as it describes the figures on the film of the camera he is using. Um, which will not be apparent until the film is developed. So Bunter is there filming the rats that the doctor is using for his research. Um, and, and so this use of metaphor, um, by the way, um, so this idea of, of latent is in the prints and in the brain and in life, um, is something Sayers also discusses in The Mind of the Maker. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but um, anticipating very recent linguistical research she notes that the mind cannot operate without the ability of metaphorical thought. Here, she simply makes her characters act accordingly. Well, you know, Peter can't um, figure out how this murder was done, but he has two additional problems. First, a policeman has already showed up and he must manage the policeman until he figures out what really happened. Because the policeman already has an idea and is off on what he thinks happened. Um, and so it seems to me that what she's describing there is an awareness that Lord Peter had of what he had to offer and how it can become problematic. Um, what Given what he is called to do, and what he understands and sees. And it's interesting because I see this as similar to the problem of the therapist. You know, I might see something, but that's as the client movement. It's the client seeing it is all that matters. And then the client sees it better than I ever could. Um, but how, how to move, um, Lord Peter's got the same problem in this, in this mystery. He's got to move ahead and bring the policeman along. Um, second, the young doctor, whom he has befriended through his interest and in his work and in Bunter's photography. Um, but the, the young doctor is failing to catch on to what really happened. Um, Peter first says to Bunter that the doctor's 
theory of the case is getting in the way of its solution. The dialogue is very clever and goes to the point that once one has a theory, one looks only for the facts that would support it. The fascinating detail is that while the doctor is careful about his research method with the rats, he loses the capacity to think clearly when dealing with his upstairs neighbor. A sketch of the tension that she writes as the murder occurs and the subsequent efforts to discover the truth about it, um, that tension or anxiety perhaps combined with his previous experiences with the husband, with the neighbors, um, with the wife, with her previous lover, all of that, the context in general, um, along with the policeman's response to the husband's story, has left the doctor with little reality and little, I'm sorry, little capacity to see the reality before him. Um, after trying to help him see the situation, Lord Peter just tells him what to do, basically. Um, on the other hand, uh, Bunter, who, uh, who um, was the deferential servant in the earlier scenes, steps up at this point, becoming Peter's intellectual partner in solving the crime. So as the two begin to uncover what is latent, which Bunter describes as he is conscious of an incongruity. Um, there's a scene where Lord Peters describes himself as a child watching the cook at work. Well, you know, <clears throat> I can picture Dorothy Sayers as a child spending time in the kitchen with the cook. And did she build on that scene somehow in, in creating this story? I, I'm guessing that. You see, I, I believe really strongly that all of life gets used somehow or another. So that's how that history in her life got used. Um, at any rate, um, Sayers uses her experience, applies it to Lord Peter, and um, he has it in a very different setting um, and, and applies it to the solution of the case. Well, then there's one more thing that happens in this story, which is a very cleverly written end with the murderer's motive touchingly described through a Bible reference made, and it made for one last treat in reading the story. I wonder how many readers remember a similar moment in their own teenage years of discovering the book, The Song of Solomon in the Bible. Um, I wonder when and how she thought of that as the ending. Did her mystery author's mind require her to say more about the motive? Um, or did she want to stress the underlying theme that emotions can get in the way of clear thinking? Or did she want to close on this note to remind her readers that the Bible does have ways of thinking about unregulated emotions? I don't know. Um, so, so that's the vindictive story of the footsteps that ran. It's a great story. Um, and just to summarize, it was an early work. She wrote it in the 1920s. And her main idea is that the research frame of mind is useful. Um, that one should stay curious, that one's own theory can get in the way of neutrality. And that she has the job in her writing, but also the character Lord Peter has the job of making it clear what happened so that others might see it. Um, and finally, you know, she she used um, she used fiction to get these points across, which just makes it so much more fun. Um, Now, um, she also wrote nonfiction, and she had some really strong opinions about artistic integrity. Um, she said that one, and this is in the Dalfonso book of, of um, her friendship with C.S. Lewis, um, 
And she wrote to him, but she thought one should only write the thing you want to say. You don't write it for money, nor applause, nor a following, and nor for doing good. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, everybody right now, in, every author wants to, it's, it's a big thing right now to have followers. Um, I guess it's not, it's been there for at least a hundred plus years. Um, and she's pointing out that that's, that's not what this is about. Um, and, and then she adds, you must not tell people what they want to hear or even need to hear unless it is the thing you passionately want to tell them. The way I think about this is that she is talking about, um, you know, she's using the word passionately. So she's talking about the emotional system and the intellectual system harnessed together in her writing. Um, and again, you know, the more one does that, the more capacity one has to do that. And then according to Bowen theory, the more capacity one has to be in relationship with others while remaining a self. Um, so the, the next idea that I wanna mention is her idea of the triangle of idea, energy activity, and response or power. Um, and she actually, she uses this to talk about the Trinity, um, but she also uses it to talk about writers. And so for right now, I'm, I'm only talking about um, the way this would operate with writers. Um, so that the writer has an idea and then there's a certain amount of activity that goes on to get that on paper. So to incarnate that idea. And then um, there's a, she uses the word power, which I'm not all that crazy about, but, but there's a response first from when the writer reads what they wrote, but then also from, from the reader later um, the response of the reader to the to the writing, and uh, you know, I I can see that clearly in what I've written, that that those three things happen, um, with with um, with this book that I wrote last year on um, all the families of the earth. Um, once I got the idea. Um, it basically wrote itself. Um, and, and I mean, it was a lot of energy and activity that went into that, but I had spent three years blogging about the scripture. And so I just needed a way to put it into a book. And when I got the idea of how to write the book, it was, it was almost like it was done, except I had to write it. Um, and then the response um, of, of the reader is so interesting to me right now. Um, then the other, th the other thing that's in this book, in the mind of the maker, is a, a looking forward that she does. And she is very much anticipating a future. Um, she wrote this during World War II. She's she's trying she's trying to um, to bring this idea to life. I think um, that that the future is is something to be anticipated. I think there's you know um, well it'd be unfair of me to say what life was like in nineteen forty one. Tough, um, and so that there's an anticipation. And a, and a creativity that she sees as tied to the looking forward, I think. She talks a lot about creativity. And she talks about Einstein's work on time and space. Um, and you know, this was, 
this was a hundred years ago. Um, and its implications for religion and Teilhard de Chardin, she talks about both of those things. So she was um, a big picture thinker. And I think, um, you know, the way I would describe it is she's trying, um, she's, she's trying to keep religion in the current conversation. And because it, in her view, religion speaks to many things that were currently going on. Um, she also, in this book, she talks a lot about the challenges with writing fiction, and it was fun for me to read. One of the particular things was she talked about um, the, the tendency of the reader to get the characters mixed up with the author, you know, and, and so take a random quote out of a book or a poem and attribute it to the author when the author had put that in the, you know, in the mouth of a character, um, not him or herself. And I know that happened with me. Um, my, my first real character in my book uh, from last year uh, was a young therapist named Emma. And, you know, by the first couple of pages, she was a different person from me. And I understood that. We talked. I mean, it's funny how it happens. But but she took on, she took on, now there, there were things about her that were informed by what I knew about being a new therapist, but she was a, a different person. So this is, this is a short list of my work. I've got my research out on ResearchGate. I've got a blog at, at my website. I've got a book I wrote in 2004, which was a redo of the screw tape letters and it's out of print. I'm trying to get it back in print, but it's out of print right now. Um, so it was a redo of the screw tape letters with uh, all the character characters from God to the devil were in the female and it was in an email format. Um, but then my most recent book, All the Families of the Earth um, is 2023. And uh, I have a quote from Dorothy Sayers here uh, that I think is so beautifully said, the, the vital power of an imaginative work requires a diversity within its unity. And the stronger the diversity, the more massive the unity. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's individuality and togetherness to me. Um, but it, it's beautifully said. And, and you know, the more well-written something is, the more you see that, the diversity within the unity. Okay, I'd like to back up here. Um, I, um, I was wondering about, and I think I have time, yeah, um, taking a few minutes to share um, a couple of pages from my book. Now, <clears throat> this is um, this is Emma, and uh, she's been at this. This is chapter four, so she's been at this work as a therapist for a while. I think she lives about two hundred years or more. But anyhow, um, uh, right now she's um, she's dealing with Rebecca, and. Um, uh, and Isaac. So um, I'll, I'm just going to read one paragraph um, from this. Dear Diary, Rebecca has had twin boys, Esau born first, and Jacob who came out clutching Esau's heel. They are not identical twins. Esau was born all red and hairy, and I can't think of who he looks like. Could it be that Esau reminds Je Rebecca of someone from her childhood, someone she did not get along with? 
because Rebecca already seems to prefer the younger boy, Jacob. Um, so right there, I'm trying to set up the story of the triangles, which becomes so important in their life. So the next entry, um, um, the stew thickens. Dear diary, Isaac came by himself today and wanted to talk about how the boys are arguing all the time. Apparently, the latest quarrel over a bowl of lentil stew, for heaven's sake, ended with Esau trading his rights as the elder son in exchange for something to eat. Jacob couldn't actually take his birthright, of course, without Isaac's consent. Still, Isaac was acting helpless about his sons not getting along and not seeing anything he could do about it. Now, in the previous chapters, I've, I've worked a lot to show um, how Isaac was a focused on child and the... Um, the, the sort of helplessness that that was a, a big part of his life. So so that's um, part of the build up here. Um, but the of course the um, the next thing that happens, um, dear diary, Rebecca came in today and said that she had managed with Jacob's cooperation. To trick Isaac into giving Jacob the blessing of the firstborn, the inheritance blessing, by the way, is thought to convey power as it is given, so there's no taking it back. Once it's done, it's done. How she managed is another story. I have seen some crazy things in my work, but this one is truly unbelievable. Remember me telling you about Esau being hairy? and Isaac being blind? Well, Rebecca had Jacob go in to see Isaac wearing Esau's clothes and sheepskin on his arms. When Jacob asked for the blessing, Isaac noticed that the voice sounded like Jacob's rather than Esau's, so he asked to feel his arms. The goofy sheepskin trick convinced him that the son before him was Esau. Isaac is upset, of course, and I'm not sure whether he knows that Rebecca thought of the trick. What made him go ahead when he noticed that the voice sounded different? Now, you know, what I'm trying to do there is, is look at the story from a family system's view. And so I also at the end of the at the end of each chapter I have a family diagram. And at the end of this chapter, this is the this is the diagram that I have. Um, so you can see um, Isaac and Rebecca up here and the lines of closeness between Rebecca and Jacob and Isaac and Esau and this sort of distance between the couple, which I, I work on through the story in, in showing that she was a consummate over-functioner, he was a consummate under-functioner. Um, so so I, that, that's been established. And then, um, you know, this conflict between Esau and Jacob is just the outgrowth of all of this. And, you know, I showed this to a group a couple of months ago with very little background of preparation. And they could, they could see it. And that was exciting to me, that they, they could see it. And, and start the, to get the idea of, of a family system's view through stories that they already knew. So this is the last part of my presentation. Um, and <laughs> uh, just stop and think for a minute. Um, what's your best guess um, on Dorothy Sayers' family background? Um, what, what, would you, what would you guess about her? Um, well, here's the, here's the diagram, and here's Dorothy. You can see that on her father's side, her father was a clergyman, her grandfather was a clergyman. Um, her grandfather was born in Ireland and immigrated sometime between 1853 and 1861. Her father was the oldest of eight. Um, her um, 
her mother was the third of four and her mother, I don't know, there's a lot of years between her sister and her. And so I'm not sure I have this right, but that's the research that I did, what I came up with. But at any rate, she had an aunt, Amy, that she was really close to um, comparatively because she didn't have a ton of family. And then um, a um, cousin, Ivy. And then um, Dorothy herself was an only child. Um, and she had a child out of wedlock um, with Bill White, and then she married um, Mac Fleming in 1926. Um, the child she had out of wedlock was raised by her cousin Ivy. So the family resourcefulness is pretty clear here. Um, that Ivy was at the time working and um, taking in foster children. So it, it worked out very well. And her, her mother was helping her at first with that work. Um, uh, so doing a timeline with this, Dorothy was born in Oxford uh, with a sibling position of an only child. She moves from Oxford to Bontesham, a small country parish where her father became the rector. So she was born in 1893 and then they moved in 1898. And I, I read that um, her mother was not as happy after they moved, that she liked the excitement and all the things going on in Oxford. Um, now, then Dorothy went to a boarding school um, and she went a little later than the other girls and she was somewhat of an outsider there. I mean, she was confirmed while she was there and it was something that she always regretted. What I've read about it, it sounds to me like there was some togetherness pressure, but I'm not really sure what happened. But she, she, did, not, um, she did not feel good about that. Um, and then um, she wins a scholarship and goes to Somerville College at Oxford. Um, she finishes college with first class honors in French. She takes a job in France and she works and teaches in various positions for a few years, but she doesn't really like to teach. And in 1920, she's awarded a BA and an MA from Oxford. She's in the first group of women to receive degrees. And then in 1922, she begins work in an advertising agency. She keeps the job for nine years. And again, it's very um, uh, anticipatory of the 21st century. I mean, she was one of the first people writing commercial ads. Um, so, and, and then um, by 1923, she's publishing the Lord Peter work. And she publishes and she gets pregnant in the same year. She has a child out of wedlock. She arranges for him to be raised by her cousin, and she marries Matt Fleming in 1924. And then in 1925, her aunt, the mother of her cousin, dies. In 28, her father dies, and in 29, her mother dies. In 1950, her spouse dies, and in 1957, she dies. Um, in her professional life, she worked as a copywriter at an ad agency. And uh, by the time she was 30, she began publishing. And later she wrote plays for the BBC on the life of Christ. Um, she translated Dante's Divine Comedy to, uh, to try to make it more current in the minds of the reader, I think, is my impression. And she wrote The Mind of the Maker, an important nonfiction piece for the Bridgehead series, which she spearheaded um, it, during World War II. And she was well-connected in the literary world, including a long-term friendship with C.S. Lewis. And that is my presentation. Yeah. And I'll be very interested in your thoughts and questions. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Lehman. Rich stuff. Um, 
I had a question for you just to start things off. You have uh, published both fiction and nonfiction. How do you see the two as different uh, for you, if at all? You know, there's a little more freedom in writing fiction. I mean, I can, you know, I can give characters ideas that may or may not be right and play with them some. Um, in, in nonfiction, I have to I have to be more more careful. Um, stick with facts. Um, it's not just that I have um, uh, I, I think I, um, I I'm thinking about the a lot of times when I start nonfiction, I never finish it. I hate to say this about myself, but it never seems quite right. Um, so I think there's, I think there's a, a higher bar there somehow. Hmm. Thanks. Okay. Uh, curious to see what, uh, questions and comments there are, uh, uh, please, uh, signify, uh, your interest in, uh, participating by, um, using the raise hand, uh, signal. I'll try to keep track of who, who I see first. And please direct questions and comments to me to pass on to Barbara Lehman. Let's see. Oh, uh, Randy Frost. See, Randy, I'm not hearing you. Are you you there? You're muted uh, with no video. Okay, I'm not sure what's happening with Randy Frost, uh, but we'll come back in a moment. Um, anyone else with a question or comment? Uh, Emma, just letting you know, Randy Frost says, I can't unmute. No. So uh, Emma to the rescue, no. or the two of you can work it out somehow. No. Uh, who else has a question or a comment? Walter Grazer. So I'm wondering... Um... <clears throat> Based on uh, Barbara's last comment about the difficulty of uh, writing uh, nonfiction versus fiction, but I'm wondering in the fiction, uh, you know, the, this this challenge of particularly for the reader is is this the author is this the character, and for the author, how does it help the author define himself? And then I look sometimes at the autobiographies or or biographies around fiction writers, and 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 for some of them, uh, they have very troubled lives, this kind of thing. So I'm just wondering. I'm not sure if my question is clear, but it's it's how does how does that fiction help them in the definition of themselves? Uh, oh, I, thank you. I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, uh, Dorothy Sayers, for example. You know, she was an only child and didn't have a lot of family around and and spent a lot of time um, by herself. And so I think that she became sort of shaped to be a writer from very early. I think that was part of what happened to her because, you know, a writer has to a writer has to work alone. I mean, that's part of it. Um, at least when they're working on their manuscripts. Um, so, so how does how does the the writing itself help one to distinguish oneself from one's characters? You know, I can remember um, in my example, um, 
of my own writing that that when um, so there were some things that Emma said that were different from what I would say. And I knew that. So that was that was interesting. That was useful for me. And of course, I have several more therapists in there after her. And I tried to give each of them a, a different, a little bit of a different kind of a therapist. Mm -hmm. But she has a lot of the book. Um, so, and she goes from very young to old. So. You have any more thoughts on that one? Well, it's, uh, um, I look at my own writing over the years and I've not written any real fiction, um, but uh, <clears throat> it is kind of a, a dialogue with myself, you know, and uh, and so when I look at some of it, uh, I'm trying to, uh, I guess I am trying to distinguish myself. Who am I in all of this? Mm -hmm. And I've got to study it. I ran uh, planning to move soon. And and so, uh, you know, throwing out things and so forth. But I've discovered something. It's about 12 or 15 pages long when I was in grad school, uh, social work. And uh, it's uh, I wrote all about myself in my early 20s. And I'm really uh, curious to look at it to yeah. see. Mm -hmm you know, what was I like? And uh, what what am I like now? And have I been dealing with the same themes all my life? Uh, and uh, so anyway, you know, it's it's certainly not fiction. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I'm curious, the writing is helpful, I guess, is what I want to say, because it does clarify. Um, and, and I'm trying you know, we can all have the tendency to lie to ourselves. But I do think the writing <laughs> is if if I just let it flow, then whatever's going to come out comes out, you know. And so I'm anxious to, to relook at that. Uh, and it was interesting to listen tonight, but it is the fiction. You know, when I think of, I love, uh, uh, I don't want to hog too much time here, but intelligence novels, you know, the spy thrillers. And, and, and I, I like looking at some of the murder mysteries and I'm thinking of Bowen theories. So what they're trying to do all the time is put together what's the facts <laughs> mm -hmm. and then they're hopefully able to solve what the mystery is and I, I tend to think sometimes too what's the facts uh uh and trying to move toward less judgment in my life uh particularly of emotions i don't like you know so it is this kind of as you said much earlier about intellectual and emotional systems trying to get them on the same page uh and so forth so anyway i that's you know, kind of where I'm at with it. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Randy Frost, you got audio? I think so. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. No, I figured it out. Okay. I, well, I was just thinking about Bowen's concept of differentiation and defining a self and the process that that entails when it's uh, with family or in relationships, um, you if you're defining the self in ways that upset the pre-existing balance of individuality and togetherness, you can predict there's going to be some pushback. Some folks telling you, you got it wrong, change back or else. Is there anything that uh, is similar uh, when you're trying to define a self as you write. I mean, I'm just wondering, because you use the term define a self and you're talking about Murray Bowen, um, does it go pick up the emotional process that you do say in trying to define more of a self in your family? Well, you know, one of the things that happens to me, and I don't know if this happens to other people or not, but but I can be writing an email. And first, what I write may be defining a self, but it's without thought for the other. Mm. So then I, I have a more mature version <laughs> where 
you know, I manage more of um, being a self while staying connected to others. Mm. So the uh, way I, I guess what I'm saying is the first version might be too reactive, mm. but it, it, that's not really defining a self because defining a self is a more mature process of respecting others while naming your position. Um, but I think it's kind of stepwise, right? Mm. And that's one of the things I really like about writing is it gives me a chance to dig my way out when I, I'm dug in. Mm -hmm. Then I guess there would be times when when you do get pushed back, even though you've you've defined yourself in a thoughtful way without uh, trying to um, be reactive. Um, but if the other or the others don't like it, you can still hear back. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, one, you know, I, I can remember, um, and, and maybe this is what Dorothy Sayers is saying I shouldn't do, but um, I can remember times and places in my book where I took out language that I thought was too strong and made something more palatable. Mm. Now, you know, did I did I lose something in that? Um, I don't know. Mm. But it's almost like I could I could hear the pushback before I <laughs> you know, before I sent it anywhere. Um and so when is that worth it, I guess? Okay. I had some really funny things in that book. Didn't make it, by the way. <laughs> okay. No. Well, I was just curious about, uh, you know, how far one can take the analogy of writing as a way of defining more of a self in terms of increasing level of differentiation. And, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, and, and, you know, a word that we don't hear a ton about in Bowen theory is creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been thinking about that. How, how is that part of the theory? I mean, it's part of being human. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the putting together the theory, um, I think, was a pretty creative enterprise. It was fun. <laughs> Dr. Bowen did. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for your your thoughts. Thank you, Randy. Margaret Markison. Thank you. Well, this I had a question earlier, but it really builds on what, what was just being talked about, which is, you know, as you're working on a big project like a book, how do you, how, I mean, how uh, you know, what what's the the work of you know getting clear for yourself whether it's fiction or nonfiction and then balancing that with you know you're trying to communicate to an audience, which means you have to take them into uh, into account as you're thinking about how you're saying what you're saying and trying to get the ideas across not partly clear clarity for yourself but also for for the audience. So I'd just like to hear more about your thinking about that. You know, um, part of my goal in writing this book is was not to use any jargon. Like I wanted a book that people that knew their Bible a little bit could read this book and could see family systems in it. And and so I I made that I made that my rule from the beginning. Now I had there's one big exception in there. I had to use triangles. And so from the beginning, I try to make triangles more or less a normal part of a word they would have been using. Um, but but the, the the question the question that you're asking is more than that, I think. Um, it's it's how to um, it's how to write a book that that. Um, what what I was trying to do was to write the book so that it was not didactic. 
so that people could see the stories and and make whatever sense they were going to make out of them themselves. Yeah, and there is a way, you know, I mean, I write mainly for church leaders um, to, to try to be clear, say what I think is important and give them the opportunity to apply it as they're able in their own context. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that clarity is really important and challenging. You mean the, the clarity that you bring? To yeah, the, yeah, right. The clarity, like making theory clear in that context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard work. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, you know, I so I blogged faithfully for three years every Friday um on the um Sunday readings. And it it kind of um surprised me because my idea when I started writing the blog was well, I'm gonna see if I see something about family systems in the scriptures. And I always did. It was always there. And that's when I realized I had to do something more with this. Well, I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question, Barbara, about just following up. You said uh, that you had been blogging for three years. And if I'm remembering earlier, you said, and once I got the idea for how the form should take for this book, it just flowed. It just came. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, with regard to the writing process itself, it, it's I can almost see the three years of blogging as searching, 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 and then clarity, and, yeah. and then yeah. away we go. How do you, how do you understand that process, that moment? You know, what's the context? What's, you know, is it is it was it magic or good luck? Was there some intention that? Yeah. Birth that creative spark? Well, you know, my first couple, I knew I had to do something with that material when I got done. And my first couple of efforts to try to put it into a, a three year lectionary book was just so boring. I could hardly, <laughs> I mean, I'd already read, I'd already written all this. I was just done with it. It's a good lens test if you're bored. <laughs> yeah, but I knew I had to do something. And so I started getting this idea about putting therapists into the story. But then what happened is that of all things, I went to Israel. And it's the only time I've ever been to Israel. And I went in the spring of 2022. And there was something about being there where I could picture you know, the, the terrain and what a cave would be on the inside and just how their life was. And after that, you could hardly stop me when I got back. Um, hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Dixie Vandersluss. Hope I got the name right. <laughs> Pretty close. Vandersluss. Okay. Um, I have a question about about being the reader. And I'll maybe tell you what what I have facing me. I um I was very very close to my grandmother, and she died almost twenty years ago, twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. And this past fall, I got a chance to visit her two half sisters who were are still alive. One of which she only discovered um in her adult life. Mm -hmm. And I brought back an entire suitcase of correspondence from my grandmother to this aunt, all according to year, wow. where she says, hey, I'm your sister. You didn't know I existed. And so what struck me with what you were saying is um, to how a person's own theory can get in the way of neutrality, because I have in so much of my life been very emotionally fused with my grandmother and some of the sadness of her life that I didn't realize till after she was gone. So I'm just curious about ideas about being a reader. And then I thought, what if I were to, from that reading, to write the process of, <laughs> you know, 
unpacking this for myself and unpacking my understanding of sort of the family process. So any thoughts or? Well, you've got a serious project ahead of you, don't you? <laughs> I mean, maybe not serious. Maybe it's can have a fun point, but but you've got, there's a lot there. Yeah, and I'm a go-getter, but it's been sitting in my office for four months and I'm kind of afraid to. I imagine. I unzip the suitcase yeah yeah where would you start kind of a feeling yeah and yeah. what's gonna come up so and yeah just thoughts on up. on how to how to read neutrally especially something that's so you know well I recommend you start with the vindictive story of the footsteps that ran <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean Dorothy Sayers, she manages to have fun with some really serious subjects. And I, I do think that what you're getting ready to plunge into, you know, is, um, is going to be a challenge in terms of um, the internal work of, of um, the intellectual system and the emotional system. should be useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Leslie Fox. Yes, hello. Uh, well, really enjoying this conversation, Barbara. I don't even know where exactly where to begin, but what I was what I sort of have focused in on my question to be is the process of editing. Um, because I've, I've been writing my entire career and more than 50 years of writing, but writing reports, writing nonfiction, um, writing uh, just factual reports, and then later on writing about the theory and trying to explain uh, in my own, supposedly in my own words, what that Dr. Bowen meant about the theory and how you could use it in organizations, for example. So there I was sort of going into fiction a little bit because I would be making up examples to illustrate the theory based on my own experience over many, many, many years of working in, in hospitals and um, with consulting. And I always will get to a point in anything that I write, any piece that I write, where it needs to be edited, where I have to get make sure the grammar is right and um, that the words that I'm not writing a lot of run on sentences and I'm not going on and on like I'm doing right now. But what I find now is I'm writing more and trying to write more based on my own life experience as it relates to all of the what's going on right now um, in essays. And after I go back and edit it, I feel like my I lose my voice that my voice yeah, gets sure. lost. It gets, um, it's, it's, it's more neutral, but I think I lose the, I, I still want to stress certain things. And so I, I struggle with at what point, and then also I edit other people's work. I'm in that position. I've done that for many, many years. And I have tried to be so careful not to edit their voice out of the piece. But it's it's a challenge, and I'm just wondering how you've dealt with that over your career in writing. Uh, thank you for that question, and and I think that's very difficult. Um, I mean, um, I can tell when I've over edited because the, the, it just goes flat, you know, and and um, and and I think. This will be controversial among Bowen theory people, but but you know you don't want to lose your voice. You want your emotional system and your intellectual system harnessed together. You don't want to dampen down on having emotions. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. um, but you you want them informed by your intellectual system. And so anyhow, um, all this is to say that. I think the danger is very real of over editing. I mean, sure, you got to get your grammar straight, but 
but do you well <laughs> I was challenging myself in, in something I was writing recently to shorten up and just write a couple of one word sentences even just for, you know, just to add variety so that the mess you want the message to be to get across that you're trying to to put out there that you had a you've had experience and experience you want to share that experience um, and at this at the same time. I, you know, I don't want to, I want to be on top of my, I'm managing my anxiety and not uh, putting that anxiety out into the, into the ether. I don't want to amplify. I think that's a lot of what's happening in our society now with just reading newspapers. It's the way you read different publications. Some you walk away from more anxious than others and others you walk away thinking that, oh yeah, there's a couple of ways to think about this. And, you know, it's, it's all, I mean, there's so, I just think there's so much to writing. And again, what I like about it is, is it pushes me to think and it, to, to consider all these things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and, but it's hard and, and uh, just, I don't know. I just, I just recently, um, somebody challenged me to let uh, a chat GPT, GPT, the AI yeah. edit something that I had written just to see what it would look like. And it com I that's why I said, oh my God, it really lost its voice. It just really over-edited it. Um, and then, so I did something with someone else, just one line, just write, write one line and then use the chat GPT thing to write basically the same thing, but let it write it, just tell it what to write about. And I, and I'm going to see if I can pick out your voice. And I absolutely, and I had two people do this. We could both pick out the person's voice. Mm -hmm. Not that we didn't pick the chat, the AI. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because this is going to be a big thing in all of our lives. coming. It's, it's here already. I mean, you know, we want to define ourselves. We want to be authentic in our lives. And I'm wondering what's going to happen to writing even talking when we can't tell if it's really us, it's really a person or not. And I don't want to go down that rabbit hole right now, but I just wanted to share with you. It's, you know, how we use words is ex extremely, extremely important, especially we, we put them in a, a blog and we realize you don't even realize how many people have read it. You just, it's like, if you're a doctor, you don't, the first thing is you don't want to do any harm. And I think, a lot of harm gets done with the written word these days, in, in, unintentionally. I don't think it's necessary. Sometimes intentionally, but I think a lot of it's really unintentional. unintentional. Anyway, thank you for a great presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your thoughts. It, it, um, it's, it's wonderful to be able to sit here and talk about writing. You know, <laughs> it is. Thank you. <laughs> Monica Griffin. Yes, thank you, Barbara, for a lovely talk about your process and thinking um, with writing. And I especially appreciate your sharing the decision not to go down the path of a boring lectionary and, and to choose instead um, to use stories from the Bible for an audience that's particularly familiar with those stories. Um, I find that really creative and, and intriguing as a process. So it comes back to sort of a differentiation of self question. As an academic writer myself, I find I'm constantly up against the community of scholars who are likely to read what I write. And I imagine in writing for an audience of potentially pastoral counselors, um, other Bowen theorists and writers, some of that may have been at play um, for you in, in your process. And so I just kind of wonder, you know, I'm thinking about all the many ways you can take one particular story in the Bible and theologians have written volumes on how to interpret that story or that particular statement on humanity that for, for many comes from a divine source. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all the more pressure for, for me at least, pseudo self just wants to get in line. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder you know, how what you were up against in this particular project and 
what you learned about differentiation of self as a writer in that in those um, moments? Well, you know, the differentiation of self as a writer, at least part of that is simply doing it. No, I can't do X, Y, or Z because I'm writing. You know, and saying that to myself and saying that to others and, and making it the thing of my life was was part of the differentiation process for me. But but on this subject of of how to how I managed what you just described, um, you know, um for one thing, um, I consulted with my Old Testament professor. Um, so I, I'm not clergy, but I did take a couple of classes at a seminary. And so I consulted with her and got clear about some things um, in the text that scholars think this or that about. So I was, I'm pretty sure I'm, I was on solid ground and I changed the things that she said, no, 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 that's not how we look at that. So that was one thing. But the, the other thing was I made a decision that my therapists were not going to especially be prayerful people. So, you know, Emma early on says, the Lord is not my thing. My, the, I, I just want to know how to, you know, whatever. Um, and so I separate the therapist position out from, and the biblical characters carry the, the weight of that. Um, and that was that was useful because it kept me kept me from having to um, uh, really take a position, um, but I could just let the characters play out their positions on. I mean, the biblical characters. So it was a you know it was a turned out to be a really nice way to write to have the therapist's voice. That just that that really worked and solved a bunch of problems. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Annette Kolsky Andreako. And please correct me if I butchered your name. Annette, you're muted. Okay, here we go. Um, I don't know if this is a question as much as it is just a comment um, and, and maybe get your um, response to it. I've been writing a, a memoir with a, a friend of mine. So it's a joint memoir about our friendship of a friendship of 50 or more years. And, um, and there are things about our lives and how we met that um, have always thematically um, been intriguing to us, the coincidences uh, and how quickly we formed our friendship. Uh, and the, the process of writing this and writing the chapters has been, um, not that difficult. I mean, it's difficult, but they've, they've flowed. Um, but the difficulty has been how to structure this memoir. And so I experimented with something <clears throat> And uh, it, I took, I, I changed the first person to third person in a couple uh, in a couple of chapters, and I found that um, so helpful in that I 
when I went to third person, I realized that if I could write about myself as the character, I could see so much more, much more detail. And um, it gave me a freedom to write. So I, I guess that's just the comment I want to make and wonder what you think about that. Well, you know, I remember the first time I gave a presentation of my family where I talked about it in the third person. And it was very hard to do, but it was useful to me to do it that way. Mm -hmm. Put my family diagram up there and, you know, Barbara this and Barbara that. And yeah, it, it was a, it was, I think, good for my brain somehow. Um, you know, I think voice is is important in writing. I mean, how you decide yes. what to do with that is that's tricky. What's more, you know, what's more compelling for the reader is one of the questions. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if Dorothy Sayers would agree with me. She was so big on doing what you felt, you know, was you wanted to write. Um, but it has to be somehow clear to the reader what you're doing. Well, yes, and I think it has to be interesting to the reader. There's a certain emotional, there's an emotional component to writing. I mean, when you read, you want to, you want to be interested in the character. The character has, in the story has to take you somewhere. It's an emotional connection. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the, I think that that's the, um, that's what carries you. And then in that process, ideas can be conveyed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the things in this little short story that I just, admired so much you know it was all through dialogue mm -hmm. she conveyed everything in the story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. thank you yeah thank you i'm thinking just with the last comment about um the south african writer jm kutsaya has a I think it's a trilogy of um, early life autobiography uh, that he writes in the third person, <laughs> and uh, and the the tone is is this fairly flat, you know, flat uh, neutral representation of this of this little boy, and in in some ways it seems that the voice gets um, even flatter or more detached the more the action, <laughs> the more emotional the action is. So there is sort of this, um, and and to to I think effective effect. Mm -hmm. So I I wonder how you um, work with uh, yeah with tone and content in that way. Um, yeah, or if there's anything about sort of um, distance from self or estrangement from self versus, uh, versus proximity to your speaking voice or. Or, or less for, uh, formal way of, of representing your thinking. Anything there? You know, I'm, I'm what came into my mind, um, Jake, was what uh, Dorothy Sayers said about the, the idea, the activity, and the, you know, the re response to it. And so that, <coughs> I'm sorry. It sounds like in the story, as the idea shifted, then then the the approach changed, the activity changed, the writing, and then the response to it um, was different because it required a different response at that point. Oh, that's helpful. Okay, I hadn't I hadn't 
quite gotten what you were talking about uh, the early on. So that's yeah, yeah, your well, relationship that way. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, see, her her idea is that that's the way the Trinity works, mm -hmm. and then that that's the way you know, and to a much smaller extent, of course, that that's the way writers work. Um, hmm. I don't, I don't know. I don't know for myself on this question. I'd have to think about that. Can you say more about the quote you shared uh, um, of, of Dorothy Sayers, the stronger the diversity, the more massive the unity and, and where you go with that? Yeah. Yeah. I was just astounded when that appeared in this book because, um, because to me, um, you know, one of the last things Bowen did in his life was he he wrote for um, he wrote a paper for the two hundred and fiftieth anniversary of Georgetown um, for a conference called Individuality and Cooperative Action, hmm. and it reminded me a lot of his paper in there and just the whole of the whole set of papers and I'm just looking at them over there on my desk but the whole set of papers um on on this idea from a from a range of writers but to me the idea that the more diversity there can be within a family the the more the strength is of the family as long as they're still connecting. And that's the thing I'm so concerned about for us people today is that we are, we have all this diversity, but we're not connecting anymore. Hmm. Um, uh, Walt Grazer again. Thanks for a second bite at the apple. Um, fascinating discussion, Barbara. Um, I was wondering, as a writer, as you did, you know, I'm reading through all the families of the earth. I don't rush through it, so maybe you deal with it later. But I'm wondering, based on these last comments, too, you know, we live in a very individualistic society as opposed to individuation. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and we're losing our contact with one another. They're talking about an epidemic of loneliness and so forth. In the biblical characters, it seems to me the tribal influence is huge. You know, so the family is located within a larger tribal unit. And so I'm imagining within Bowen theory, the process of differentiation, I would think, is is huge. Maybe it's no different than the struggle we have to have in our own society. But I'm just wondering if you, you know, maybe as a writer, you narrow it down. I'm, I'm going to look at these family structures uh, and so forth. But what about, I will call the larger social tribal aspect because of course god's covenant is with the people and everybody acts you know for that abraham has a role it's not just god and abraham or you know this kind of thing so anyway i'm just wondering you know how you thought about that as a writer when you decided to put it together well um it's it's a subject that i'm very interested in and stephanie farrar was here and she wrote a fascinating article for the Family Systems Journal a few years ago on tribalism. Um, I um, in the in the book I close my very last. It closes with something about tribalism. It's the very it's the very last piece, um, and it's it's based in you know it's really handy because it closes with the Book of Ruth, and there they are in Moab and. So it's the perfect setup for that. Thank you all. Thanks. Any final questions or comments? You know, um, I I want to say thank you. I've I've seen many people here tonight. Um, um, my best to each and every one of you. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, I'll be interested in any any thoughts or comments you have about this subject. Um, 
my email is blayman at the bowencenter.org and I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you not only for uh, your writing, Barbara, but also this evening for your reflection on, on writing that invites the rest of us to do likewise, uh, a really rich evening. Um, I invite everyone here to come back for um, the next professional lecture in this series by Lori Lassiter on March 14th. Hope to see you then.